welcome to the Evidence Informed Teaching Podcast. Are you a teacher wanting to improve your classroom practice and deliver excellent teaching through access to research? Do you have a passion for teaching and are looking to connect with other like-minded colleagues through professional discussions? The Charter College has partnered with TeacherTap to support teachers to deliver excellent teaching through access to research and we invite you to be part of this community. On this podcast you will hear from fellow teachers, research experts and you have the opportunity to be part of this professional discussion. You can find out more about the Charter College of Teaching and Teacher Tap in the show notes and if you find this episode helpful why not share it with a teacher friend, take a screenshot and post it on your social media or even better leave us a five star written review. My name is Dame Alison Peacock. I'm the Chief Executive of the Chartered College of Teaching, and I'm delighted to be joined today by Emma Hollis, who is Executive Director of the National Association of School-Based Teacher Trainers. Lovely to talk to you today. Can you tell me, Nesbitt, who are they? What do they do? Tell me about you. Absolutely. So um, I'm Emma Hollis. I'm Executive Director of Nesbitt, which is the National Association of School-Based Teacher Trainers. And we're a membership organisation for, as it says on the tin, um, ITT providers, t- providers of teacher training, predominantly school based providers, although we do have a, a significant and growing number of, of university members as well. Um, and we we offer services that support the professional development of those who are involved in the professional development of initial trainee teachers. So we um, provide advocacy and support. Um, we are a, a one stop shop for guidance and uh, any questions that people have about their role and, and policy and how they go about doing that. But we also have a suite of resources which support trainee teachers directly with their subject knowledge development. And as we're going to talk about today, we have a suite of resources that support mentors with their professional development in supporting trainee teachers in schools. If if I'm if I could start with changes to mentoring requirements as they relate to initial teacher education, when do these come into force? What are they and when do they come into force? Absolutely. So there are some key changes coming in across the landscape for initial teacher education, which um, come into force from September 2024. So anybody who is recruited from the next recruitment cycle um, will be expected to um, to start in usually in September and their programmes will be meeting the new quality requirements. And that's from off the back of a market review carried out by government where um, a group of um, expert advisors got together to look at uh, current expectations in ITT and came up with a set of recommendations for um, government to consider um, for changes to the ITT landscape. Um, and there were a number of a number of quite significant changes, but the one we're talking about today is some specific um, expectations around mentor training and development and the involvement in school based mentors in the professional development of trainee teachers. So um, many providers are starting to, to trial and bring in some of the expectations for September 2023 so that they can really be up to speed and ready to go. Um, but formally, the requirements start September 2024. So presumably NASBIT will be providing advice and support for anybody who wants it. I mean, Absolutely. you're a brilliant organisation and you're really there to help. What, what do the changes really mean in practical terms for schools hosting trainee teachers in the future? So in many instances, schools will, um, it will all feel very familiar to schools. So providers are working really hard to make the transition as seamless as possible. And schools who are already really closely involved in ITT provision will already be aware that um, it's not new that we know about the importance of mentoring and the quality of mentors to support our trainee teachers. It's not as though we've we've been ignoring that aspect of um, the importance of our provision. Um, What is changing is our specific expectations around number of hours. Um, And so you may be being asked to track things slightly differently. So um, the first kind of formal change is that there's a minimum of one and a half hours mentoring time um, that is is kind of tracked in terms of if you've got a trainee teacher in class with you. Now, any mentor listening to this, I'm sure will say I spend significantly more than an hour and a half with my trainee teacher in in any given week. Um, and we very much recognize that we don't we don't think that actually we're asking more of mentors in in suggesting that there's an hour and a half a week. We know that mentors spend uh, significantly more time than that with their trainee teachers. 
Um, but this is a minimum. It's it's a kind of minimum entitlement to make sure trainee teachers, particularly if the mentor isn't necessarily in the classroom with them, perhaps as a visiting visiting tutor, or there are, there are other models where you wouldn't necessarily always be uh, working with your trainee teacher. And so you might be asked to track that in a different way. You may be asked to just um, be monitoring the time that you're spent doing formal mentoring activities with your trainee teacher. The other big change um, is that there is a um, specified number of hours of training and development that a mentor will undergo when they're working with an ITT provider to support a trainee teacher. And it will, be, it will depend on how long you've been a mentor as to how many hours they will be. So in the first year of being a mentor with an ITT provider, the expectation if you are what is being termed a general mentor is 20 hours of, of training. Now, that's not necessarily 20 hours of face to face CPD where you need to go and sit in a room with other mentors and, and um, kind of have synchronous professional development. There will be an element of that either synchronously through um through um, an online portal or, or physically in, in space there will be some some teach some taught uh, aspect of those 20 hours but there will also be um, additional types of CPD professional development where you are asked to either undertake some self-study or perhaps there will be quality assurance of um, you know, a, a, what somebody from the ITT provider may come in and watch you interact with your trainee teacher and give you feedback and all of that counts towards your professional development so in the first year that you work with an ITT provider, there will be 20 hours, a 20 hour program designed to upskill you as a mentor and to really recognise the importance of that role, focus on that role and give you the confidence and the skills you need to excel in that role. If you are a lead mentor, which is a slightly different role, which again is one of the changes that's been brought about um, as a result of the ITT market review, uh, then that requirement is 30 hours but lead mentors will have a, a a defined role by the ITT provider and their responsibility is is to be responsible for the professional development of groups of mentors every subsequent year you then work with an ITT provider for general mentors you will have refresher training um, so further professional development and although it's called refresher training the intention isn't that you simply go over old ground the intention is that you you move yourself forward your understanding forward your your knowledge your skills your understanding forward and truly develop as a, as a professional as a mentor alongside your other roles that you hold and that will be six hours for each subsequent year or if you're in that lead mentor role it would be 12 hours if you've been mentoring up until now it just the clock stop and it all starts again you've got to do your 20 hours or can you claim experience you can absolutely there's, there's an assessment of prior learning for want of a better term so um, each ITT provider has to design 20 hours of training so if we talk about a general mentor in their first year just for simplicity Every ITT provider will need to design a full 20 hours of CPD for their uh, imagining a mentor was walking through the door fresh, never having mentored before. Um, but for anybody who has been mentoring in the past, perhaps has undergone recently the ECF mentor training with a lead provider, for example, or has been mentoring with that ITT provider or other uh, indeed other ITT providers in your region, they will. Um, assess your prior learning and, and each ITT provider is approaching this slightly differently but they will work with you to understand where your knowledge already sits and then they will determine a pathway specifically for you so it may be that they simply say you don't need to come to these three sessions because these are on things that you've already covered and we we know that you're really confident in that or it, uh, it might be that they shape your your kind of independent professional learning differently or they allow you to take your professional learning in a different direction so each ITT provider will approach that slightly differently. But no, we're not imagining that every mentor, everybody who's been mentoring for years is now fresh out of the box uh, and brand uh, shiny new and needs needs to start again from the beginning. There will be a sensitive approach to that as ITT providers work with their mentors. And where does the where does the chartered college mentor um, route sit within all of this? I think it beautifully complements what's being expected. I think one of the things that there's a there has been an awful lot of rhetoric around many of the um, quality requirements. It has been a, a really bruising and damaging experience for many ITT providers. And we don't need to go into the kind of the details of that, but it, it's not been an easy time for ITT providers. But one of the things I think the sector as a whole is really excited about is that the mentor, the, the importance of that mentoring role is really starting to be recognised. And um, 
recognizing that it is not a bolt on something that you can do in a spare minute or two, but actually it is a an additional role that needs to be recognized as such, needs to be celebrated, but also needs time and professional development and support and uh, the ability to go and engage with research and improve your knowledge. It's it's not something that you simply do um, in, a, in a spare couple of minutes. And that's where I think the um, uh, the program that you've put together in terms of the chartered mentor status really supports that professional growth and ITT providers who are working with mentors who perhaps um, are very experienced and want to take themselves further with their knowledge and their understanding and their careers um, and continue to support trainee teachers into into the future are advising their mentors to um, engage with that program and to use that as a way to recognize all of the really hard work that we know they put into uh, what they do as mentors and that that role is celebrated. And what we're starting to see, and I hope will continue, is be because of the, um, uh, the reputation that the Chartered College has and your other programs have, uh, school leaders now are recognizing the value of that and so it is becoming part of somebody's internal um, CPD and professional development as well if they're engaging with mentoring so it's really great to see that being, um, being and that's good. across the sector. That's good to hear I mean obviously I, I know you're aware but there may there may be there may be a listener that's never heard of the Chartered College I mean, you never know but um, what we're trying to do very much from the Chartered College is build expertise of teachers but also give them recognition for the skills they already have mm -hmm. and build the respect that they deserve across society um, so if you're going to be carrying out a role why not gain some accreditation for it it's, it strikes me and also why not make sure that you are absolutely on top of your game in terms of the role that you're carrying out because to be a mentor is absolutely crucial isn't it I mean that the, it, it makes it's either a make or break for so many new teachers Absolutely. And you you well, anyone listening that's a teacher themselves will remember their own mentors, either yeah. fondly or not. And <laughs> they were I'm sure more often than not fondly. Um, oh. But they, every ITT provider will tell you that it is the the mentor, um, that their team of mentors or mentor workforce is the term that the um, the DFE use that make their programs successful. Um, it is only through the nurturing, the development, the, the um, you are you are there to be a professional ear, sometimes a personal ear, um, but you make you are shaping the next generation of, of teachers, and that takes a huge amount of skill. It takes a huge amount of dedication. It does take time, and all of that needs, as you're absolutely right, Alison, it needs to be recognised and celebrated and. Um, you, as you say, why not gain accreditation and a status yes. alongside yes. that? Because I feel as though when the early career framework was rolled out, there was a huge expectation on, on behalf of mentors, but really very little kind of recognition of all of that work that was done. It was almost kind of like, well, we've got people in the system that will help. Mm. Um, and, and I remember saying at the time, you know, if we want to shift the culture of schools in terms of professional learning we need to do it right from the beginning when teachers are first training to teach when they first come into schools they need to be excited and elevated by the professional learning that they have on offer so I'm you know I'm, I'm pleased to hear that this is is beginning to uh, take shape mm. um, I guess it's it's making sure that any professional development for mentors is hugely valued by them because I'm thinking back to when I was a head teacher and maybe there would be someone who would come forward and they say, yes, I'd, you know, I'd e-mentor this new teacher. But then the thought of having to go and spend however many hours kind of topping up their training felt like a task that was a kind of tick box thing that had to be done. I think shifting away from that towards um, an opportunity to really grow one's knowledge, develop one's um, expertise rather than feeling, oh, this is something that's just got to, I've just got to prove to somebody that I can do what I do. Um, is going to be the key, isn't it, really? It's about how we build that culture of opportunity rather than compliance. That, it really um, is. It um, really is. And I think there is a, there is a danger that um, as, a, as a profession, we are being herded towards, um, through, through policy that's, that's being published and, and the way that policy sometimes is interpreted, being herded towards a culture of compliance rather than genuine 
um, professional development, which starts where you are and takes you in the direction in which you want to go to an, to an extent. I mean, there are certain skills and, and knowledge and understanding that you would want a mentor to have. But beyond that, there are also multiple directions you could take that learning, which excite you and empower you and infuse you so that when the trainee teacher walks through the door or the early career teacher walks through the door they see a vibrant committed excited professional and that's going to do more for retention in the profession and um, recruitment into the profession the two big challenges we're, we're facing as a sector at the moment than anything else could if we were all as teachers and mentors out there singing to the uh, hilltops about how brilliant our jobs were uh, then we would we would be attracting more people in and I think we need as a sector we need to work within the constraints of policy we can't work outside of policy but we need to work within the constraints of that policy to meet mentors where they are and not to shoe box uh, shoehorn them into a box is what I'm trying to say shoehorn <laughs> them into a box of compliance and and kind of ticking off um something to to please somebody in an office somewhere that that you know rarely sets foot inside a school that's not what we want to do as a sector it's not none of the people I work with uh, want to move towards that and we have to be uh, to brave enough to work within the policy constraints that we're given um, to to allow mentors to flourish in the role that they're in. Absolutely absolutely and I think there is that sort of sense of you know when you when you're being mentored by somebody or when you're involved or when you go to somebody for help you ask them for advice mm -hmm. The last thing you want is a kind of, um, well, first I've got to do this, then I've got to tick off that, then I've got to ask this, then I've got to clarify the information. You know, you wouldn't want to be um, working with somebody who you felt was just going through, jumping through hoops. Mm. You'd want, you want to be with somebody who is genuine, who cares about the children, cares about your performance in the classroom, cares about supporting you, cares about your development, um, celebrates with you when things go really well you know, feels really proud of your achievements as well as helping you when things go wrong. And inevitably, when one is in a situation of learning a new career, there are going to be times that it's difficult. And we need to feel that we've got people on our side, don't we, who are going to help us really get through and do the best that we can. So yeah. I think all that human side, all that compassionate side, all that real authentic teacher side, we have to do so much to make sure that all of that is alive and well so that um, mm -hmm. we're not just ticking boxes <laughs> and as a mentor you're doing that on two levels because you of course have to do it for a for a trainee teacher who is also then feeling all of that for the pupils that they're supporting yes, and so you're helping them to understand how to manage all of that for themselves and then for the pupils yes. that they're managing which is why I mean we we we've obviously your um chartered mentor status we've also got our mental development modules which we're working in partnership with you on we're really excited about that partnership and within our mental development modules um, we have a suite of uh, there will be 60 modules by 2024 currently 30 rolling out for September um, this year um, but they are designed around a professional framework for teacher educators that doesn't come out of any government policy so that professional framework for teacher educators was developed with the sector we worked with teaching schools as were at the time, um, ITT providers, universities, and we were really fortunate to also be working with a, a team from the Netherlands who had done something similar in the Netherlands for their teacher educators. And we developed a framework for teacher educators that goes beyond something very formulaic. And so there are modules in there that talk about ethical leadership there are modules in there that talking about that talk about supporting the mental health and well-being of your trainee teacher there are modules in there that talk about how to be effective in as a pastoral leader and how to support a trainee teacher to be a pastoral leader so we we are trying to um to work towards everything i was just talking about about meeting the mentor where they are and, and seeing them as a whole that role as a whole um, and not just something that meets a particular policy, because policies will come and go, they will change, governments will change, and new new policies will come through. But ultimately, what it means to be a great mentor, what it means to nurture people into the profession, we have a solid understanding of what that needs, and it includes everything that you've just talked about there in terms of being a human first yes. mentor as well as a human first teacher. Indeed. So anybody listening to this who is thinking, well, you know, I'd love to engage in some of that training that NASBA is offering, where, where can they go? Where do they find out more about 
So yeah. initially, if you come to our, our website, so Nasbit, N-A-S-B-T-T, -T, nasbit.org.uk, then um, you'll find the mentor development modules from there. At the moment, the, the vast majority of um, uh, organisations that are engaging with those are ITT providers. So if you're a mentor working with an ITT provider, chance and they're a NASBIT member, which uh, nearly all I, nearly all skits are and a, and a significant number of, of universities as well. Chances are they've been talking to us about it and they they know the um, the modules and they'll also be aware of the Chartered College and what they're offering and the partnership between us. So Brilliant. talk to your ITT provider if you're already working with an ITT provider. But by all means, have a look at our website if you're interested in what the modules are and to learn how, to learn more. It's all there for you. Well, I think that sounds absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, Emma. Thank you for all the work you're doing for the sector. Um, thank you for working with the Chartered College. Um, but mostly, I want to thank you on behalf of mentors in the system because, you know, they are so important. The role that they carry out is absolutely foundational for future teachers, and we need to support them the best way we can. Sounds like we've got a great menu of opportunities on the stocks. Absolutely. So thank you very much. Indeed, for speaking to me today. It's been lovely to talk to you. Thank, Thank you for having me. Likewise. If you have enjoyed today's episode and would like to access more research evidence for your classroom, you can join the Chartered College of Teaching for as little as one ninety six per month at www.chartered.college. And remember to download TeacherTap free from your app or Play Store to share your views, opinions and experiences from the classroom. Every voice makes the picture clearer. Can you tell me, um, Nesbitt, who are they? What do they do? Tell me about you. Absolutely. So um, I'm Emma Hollis. I'm Executive Director of Nesbitt, which is the National Association of School-Based Teacher Trainers. And we're a membership organisation for, as it says on the tin, um, ITT providers, providers of teacher training, predominantly school-based providers, although we do have a, a significant and growing number of, of university members as well. Um, and we we offer services that support the professional development of those who are involved in the professional development of initial trainee teachers. So we um, provide advocacy and support. Um, we are a, a one stop shop for guidance and uh, any questions that people have about their role and, and policy and how they go about doing that. But we also have a suite of resources which support trainee teachers directly with their subject knowledge development. And as we're going to talk about today, we have a suite of resources that support mentors with their professional development in supporting trainee teachers in schools.